Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. I am Nick. I'm Jared. In this episode, we are talking about the value and the function of zombie comedies. Um, And we're using Zombieland as sort of the archetypical example. We're going to be guided here by an article by Dr. Kyle William Bishop, who is a professor uh, professor of English at uh, Southern Utah University. He teaches film and screen studies, American literature, culture, fantasy, horror literature, and English composition. And it's a 2011 article titled Vacationing in Zombieland, the Classical Functions of the Modern Zombie Comedy. We'll also be drawing a lot from Northrop Fry's Anatomy of Criticism and the frameworks that he creates there. We'll talk about who he is and stuff uh, in a few minutes. Um, But the main argument that Bishop makes in his article, which is going to guide us today, he says, quote, I argue that the central defining feature of the screen zombity, which is a zombie comedy, the screen zombity is not the cathartic sight gags resulting from the excessive slaughter of various reanimated corpses, but rather the recreation of an almost utopian human society, one in which the previously ostracized hero has found purpose, stability, and social inclusion by establishing a traditional family structure. So Bishop argues basically you know, the, the zombie genre in general has been largely ignored by, you know, the academy and academics and serious critics, like overall, but that specifically zombie comedies have been ignored as, you know, just gratuitously violent and just humorous to an extent of not being, not deserving to be taken seriously. He argues that actually, the zombie comedies, specifically Zombie Land, is the ex- example we're going to be talking about, fits perfectly within you know the dramatic comedy trope, and so we should be taking it seriously. There are lessons to be learned, and so we're going to explain that in depth of how that happens and what that looks like in this episode. Anything to add? So yes, uh, a few things. So as we kind of uh, we've we've dipped our toes into this like apocalyptic foray for at least our last handful of episodes, and what and we've done them all out of order. Um, not necessarily intentionally, but because um, as we research, we're just, of course, uh, finding the genealogy of certain ideas and certain tropes and things along those lines. And so we're just touching upon the research part, right? Like we would if we were going to plan a class or write an article about this topic of the apocalypse. So that's what we're doing here. I only mention this because we actually have not touched upon, we've touched upon a lot of apocalypses so far, but not the zombie one yet. So mm-hmm. we actually have not even set the stage for like the regular zombie apocalypse for us to then... Um, challenge that with this idea of zombie comedies. And and, and again, that, that doesn't mean we won't do a zombie one in the future. We actually probably w- do will. I mentioned this because he talks about some of the more common tropes as to why the zombie genre is popular and he challenges those as well. Mm-hmm. So I want to get those out of the way real quick before we do an entire episode on them down in the future. The first one is that zombie slaughter is cathartic. This idea that traditional zombie tropes, Walking Dead or 28 Days Later, or I, I don't even know, the more popular ones, the, uh, what are the, 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 they're not even more popular. Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead, thank you, yes. Mm-hmm. All of these other ones. That we watch those and consume those because there is a catharsis to watching this type of slaughter and seeing the end and perhaps beginning to start anew. The other reason, the other main reason we often see the zombie trope as apocalypse is it's also a social commentary on the problems with humanity, which the comedy actually is going to throw on its head. But once you get done dealing with the zombies, every one of these um, zombie shows or films or even um, um, books talks or basically goes into the idea that it is the humans that become much more the problem later, right? Once you're done dealing with the zombies and you have like this kind of system of dealing with them, shooting them in the head, stabbing them in the head, whatever, they become the backstory to like the human condition and what it's like to recreate society. And in every one of these, there's a social commentary that people recreate the same dumb, violent circles that they did that existed before the zombie trope. The zombie throws that on its head, that you actually mm-hmm. do get to create this like kind of utopian recreation of what humanity will be. And so I think that's one of the important things that he's talking about. And I just wanted to make sure that was clear. It was kind of a long tangent we went on just there, mm-hmm. but I think it's important for us since we have not kind of set the stage for why zombie apocalypses are already popular that we talk about that. Good. Okay. So first we have to talk about Northrop Fry's Anatomy of Criticism, a couple of details there. Northrop Fry, if you've never heard of him, was a professor at the University of Toronto. He was one of the, if not the 20th century's most prominent literary critic, 
theorist and professor. He's most famous for his 1971 book, The Anatomy of Criticism, Four Essays, The Anatomy of Criticism, Four Essays, uh, in which he outlines theories and techniques for literary criticism. If you've never heard of it, it is like the seminal work in the 20th century for critique um, before the advent of like deconstructive criticism and postmodernism and poststructuralism, et cetera. Um, it's, what, it's like the book to read on critique, specifically literary critique, and then extending into film and so forth. Again, it's called The Anatomy of Criticism for Essays. So we're just going to pluck out a couple of ideas from that book that Bishop uses in his article that we can apply to Zombieland. So the first is high versus low mimetic. Fry says, quote, fictions may be classified not morally, but by the hero's power of action, which may be greater than ours, less or roughly the same. So the first one is high mimetic. And he says, quote, if superior in degree to other men, but not to his natural environment, the hero is a leader. He has authority, passion, and powers of expression far greater than ours. But what he does is subject both to social criticism and to the order of nature. This is the hero of the high mimetic mode, of most epic and tragedy, and is primarily the kind of hero that Aristotle had in mind. So again, heroes of the high mimetic mode are superior in degree to other human beings. Okay, low mimetic mode is, quote, If superior neither to other men nor to his environment, the hero is one of us. We respond to a sense of his common humanity and demand from the poet the same canons of probability that we find in our own experience. This gives us the hero of the low mimetic mode of most comedy and of realistic fiction. So the hero in low mimetic literature in Fry's uh, example or cinema doesn't have any superpowers. They're not morally superior. They're basically like you and I. They're just regular human beings. They don't have like supernatural powers, like none of those things. They're just regular people. Um, This is important because the zombie comedy is a low mimetic comedy, which we'll get to in a second. Then Fry talks about different modes of fiction, and he talks about tragedy, comedy, and different uh, thematic modes. We're clearly only going to be talking about comedy here. He says, quote, the theme of the comic is the integration of society, which usually takes the form of incorporating a central character into it. So there's a relationship between the hero and society in a comedy. And like he says, usually it's the comedy, the plot of the comedy is the hero integrating into society. Then he further says, quote, new comedy normally presents an erotic intrigue between a young man and a young woman, which is blocked by some kind of opposition, usually paternal and resolved by a twist in the plot. Okay, so now we have two aspects of the comedy, integration into society or the creation of a new society and romantic interest, right? He calls it erotic intrigue. He continues. At the beginning of the play, the forces thwarting the hero are in control of the play's society. But after a discovery in which the hero becomes wealthy or the heroine respectable, a new society crystallizes on the stage around the hero and his bride. The action of the comedy thus moves towards the incorporation of the hero into the society that he naturally fits. The hero himself is seldom a very interesting person. In conformity with low mimetic decorum, he is ordinary in his virtues, but socially attractive. So again, this is a low mimetic, we're after low mimetic comedy. The hero is just a normal person, right? Seldom very interesting, according to Fry. Then finally, and this is an important point for what we're going to get to when we apply the this framework to Zombieland specifically, and Bishop will help us there, um, the romance and family and its importance in comedy. Fry says, quote, in comedy, the erotic and social affinities of the hero are combined and unified in the final scene. Tragedy usually makes love and the social structure irreconcilable and contending forces, a conflict which reduces love to passion and social activity to a forbidding and imperative duty. Comedy is much concerned with integrating the family and adjusting the family to society as a whole. Tragedy is much concerned with breaking up the family and opposing it to the rest of the society. So the comedy is focused on integrating love and family into society, whereas tragedy, the conflict in tragedy is the family as divided from 
society. So family plays a very interesting role in the comedy, according to Northrop Fry. All right, you want to jump in there? Anything to add? No, not yet. Um, no, not yet. Okay. So how does Zombieland play into this framework? How can we apply this framework to Zombieland? And I mean, the point here that Bishop is making is that Zombieland is really, he talks, he gives credit to Shaun of the Dead um, being like basically, you know, the OG zombie comedy for the most part. It's not the very first, but I mean, it's really the one that most people are familiar with. He, he gives it credit where credit is due, but says, you know, it is really just a work of humor um, that it doesn't have nearly the depth as a drama as Zombieland does, which is why he focuses on Zombieland as like the prototypical example here. So first off, Zombieland is low mimetic, meaning that the hero is just like every one of us, right? Mm -hmm. Columbus, if you, I'm not going to do a plot synopsis of Zombieland. If you haven't seen it, I don't know how that's possible. Go watch it before uh, you, uh, we're going to spoil it here for you. So if you care, go watch it first. Columbus is the main character. All the characters are named after basically either their hometown or where they're going. So Columbus is the hero and he's played by Jesse Eisenberg. And he is, to quote Fry again, superior neither to other men nor to his environment. He's quote unquote, one of us, right? We can relate to him. In fact, in the film, he's a self-professed loner. I've always been kind of a loner. I avoided other people like they were zombies even before they were zombies. Now that they are all zombies, I kind of miss people. And I think this is funny because this is basically, in all of his famous films, the, this is Jesse Eisenberg's character like every single time, right? But he if also like says like that trope's kind of popular because he also uses the adjective Michael Sarah like which... yeah. Yeah, like the so two I mean, of them are like the, yeah. right, yeah. exactly. Yep, yeah. completely. So definitely low mimetic, right? The hero, Columbus, Jesse Eisenberg is just like one of us. He's just a normal human being. Yeah. He's not superior to other men nor his environment. Okay, now how is this a comedy? Now, we have to stress here though, we're not just talking comedy and like the common sense of the word regarding humor. Clearly it is a funny zombie film, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking right. about drama dramatic comedy according to northrop fry's framework which is a whole other thing right it's certain plot points certain character you know transformations throughout the film certain specific things have to happen it's not just about humor which is important to understand i think so it's all about the hero's journey right and the hero's journey the journey of columbus in the beginning is to find his family his actual real family so i'm on my way from my college dorm in austin texas to columbus ohio where I'm hoping my parents are still alive. Even though we were never really close, it'd just be nice to see a familiar face or any face that doesn't have blood dripping from its lips and flesh between its teeth. That's basically how the film starts. He's on his way to Ohio in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. Most people are dead. There's a few humans living. He's trying to make it back to his hometown from I think Austin, Texas is where he was coming from. He was at school in Austin. He's trying to make it back to Columbus, Ohio to find his family. He finds out eventually that Columbus, Ohio burned to the ground is what uh, Wichita is the girl's name played by Emma Stone. Wichita tells him eventually, you know, Columbus, Ohio burned to the ground, no longer exists, and that his family is basically dead. Then he says, I'm not sure what's more tragic, that my family is gone or the realization that I never really had much of a family to begin with. Either way, I can't pretend that whatever I'm looking for, I'll find by going home. I have no home. So this is just another example of how the family is an important part of this story, right, in Zombieland. That if you're just watching it to be under, entertained by the violence and the humor, you're missing the subtext that is like the key of the plot, right, and how it fits into the dramatic comedy framework from Northrop Fry. And in fact, all of the characters are lacking a family. Columbus says, I could tell she knew what I was feeling. We were all orphans in Zombieland. Right, like none of or none of the ones that we see anyway, surviving humans have a family remaining. And in fact, Tallahassee, played by Woody Harrelson, his main pain is that his son died as a result of the apocalypse. Right. He became infected and died, um, which we find out towards the end of the film. Once Columbus finds out that his family is dead, his journey then includes getting, quote unquote, Wichita, right? Played by Emma Stone. He wants a girlfriend. He wants to, you know, achieve this milestone in his life. 
And he it says, quote, a little bit by like one of the first zombies to attack him was another girl uh, that he yeah. only calls by like the apartment number. She yeah, 406, in. I think. Yeah, yeah. 406. Mm-hmm. Um, he had this obsession with her for a very long time. Finally, the zomb- zombie apocalypse breaks out. They, and I actually forget how, but long story short, they end up in the same room. She like is, mm-hmm. is, is with him. And then obviously the apocalypse break out and it ruins his, his chances there. So yeah, just she like comes like apocalypse. screaming to him because she's yeah. on the way back from the bar. I watched yeah. it today. Is the only reason I remember these details okay she was coming home from a bar and a homeless man runs after her and tries to bite her well we learn later on that it's a zombie like the, it's just breaking out so she comes to his apartment like banging on the door and he lets her in and like consoles consoles her and he's like freaking out because she's the hot neighbor and like she falls asleep on the couch and he falls asleep and wakes up but when he wakes up she has converted to a zombie and tries to attack him and that's the first he learns of like the apocalypse so yeah there's this plot device where he's like you know yearning for a girlfriend and the hot girl in room in you know apartment 406 in the beginning we see like he thought that it was finally going to happen and then she becomes a zombie right but that's that's setting up the plot for what like to to follow his journey right these are two exactly. dilemmas that he is faced with immediately first like the lack of family then the lack of a significant other both are introduced very early on and then the zombie apocalypse strips him of both right it strips him of his family mm-hmm. back in columbus and it strips him of his first opportunity to be um with a, a a woman in this case um because she obviously turns she turns into a zombie and this ruins his opportunity and there's kind of a comedic fight that they actually have where he breaks mm-hmm. her ankle and stuff like that but regardless those are stripped which does present the opportunity for a him to pursue this relationship with wichita which is going to solve that problem and then of course i'm assuming i don't want to spoil it but you're going to get to the idea where this new Mm -hmm. that he is with becomes that family that he was disconnected from as well and you said a key word there which is lack right whenever you're like writing fiction or specifically like screenwriting or analyzing a film or something right you're always looking for what the character is lacking right what is their central lack that's driving them forward in the plot and you nailed it for columbus in Zombieland. it's a girlfriend and a family right a belonging yeah. with other human beings that's his lack that he's trying to fill throughout this um oh uh, just an uh, uh, a tangent for a second he bishop meaning the author of the article says that basically Zombieland is dawn of the dead combined with national lampoon's family vacation which i literally had never thought of before but it's so obvious once he said that that that's exactly what it is right you know yeah so columbus says it wasn't just because i had nowhere else to go it was because in that moment it became clear wherever this girl was that's where i wanted to be Right. So now his new goal in the film, in the plot, is to get this girl, right, Wichita. And Fry explains that the hero's social and romantic journey often become combined in the dramatic comedy. Quote, in the comedy, the erotic and social affinities of the hero are combined and unified in the final scene. And we're going to see exactly how that happens in just a minute. So he's no longer Columbus, the hero, looking for his specific family. At this point in the film, he's just searching for a family, right? He's searching for belonging. And in fact, everyone in the film is looking for this, right? And they're trying to create some amount of normalcy. Fry's, to use Fry's terms, right? A new society that they can create, a new mini society. And in the plot, Wichita and Little Rock. So Wichita is played by Emma Stone. Little Rock is played by a younger woman who I can't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, And they are like partners in crime. They are both on their way to Pacific Playland, which is an amusement park in Los Angeles. And they explain that, you know, Wichita basically explains to Columbus that, you know, Little Rock has grown up in the zombie apocalypse, has never had any amount of normalcy. Like, I just want to go there. Like, it seems silly, but I want to take her there so that she can be a kid. Right. They're trying to create some amount of normalcy in the Mm -hmm. middle of the apocalypse, essentially. In the end. Columbus saves Little Rock and Wichita. They go to, they actually ditch Tallahassee and Columbus and go to Pacific Playland on their own and they get trapped there by a horde of zombies. Columbus ends up coming with Tallahassee and saving the day. He becomes the actual hero like in the film. And in the end, he gets the girl. In fact, the defining moment is he kisses her. They kiss and, you know, he gets the girl. His romantic needs are fulfilled. And he creates this new mini society. The four of them create this new mini society together. They essentially become a proto family, right? And this really has two layers for Columbus's character 
because he lacked belonging even in the pre-zombie society, right? He said, I'm a loner. I didn't appreciate people, right? Even before there were zombies, I avoided them basically at all costs. So not only did he not belong in pre-zombie society, he definitely didn't belong. Like he didn't have a friend group, et cetera, in zombie land, right? So this is really the first time for him that he belongs anywhere. And so they all coalesce into this sort of proto-family and they all basically get what they were lacking, right? They trust one another. That face, that's me realizing that those smart girls in that big black truck and that big guy in that snakeskin jacket, they were the closest to something I'd always wanted, but never really had, a family. I trusted them and they trusted me. Rule number 32, enjoy the little things. Tallahassee got his Twinkie. And even though life would never be simple or innocent again, as he savored that spongy yellow log of cream, we had hope. We had each other. And without other people, well, you might as well be a zombie. And then the film ends. And so in the end, he finds his romantic interest and he finds his family, his, you know, like Fry says, his romantic interest and his desire for this new society this desire for a family get combined and reconciled and sort of solved in the end. So, and then here's the other thing that I kind of want to add to it as an addendum. I actually still have not seen the second one, um, Double Tap no, or whatever. But mm-hmm. while doing a little bit of research for this, um, and I, 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 YouTube, I guess, had a free first 10 minutes of the movie on there. Some Sony, mm-hmm. Sony Entertainment, whatever, allowed like the first mm-hmm. 10 minutes to be free on YouTube. So I did. I, I watched the first 10 minutes of the next movie, right? The the sequel, which is like 10 years later or mm-hmm. something like that. Anyway, well, it's not supposed to be 10 years. Yeah, I think it is 10 years later. Anyway, whatever it is. He opens with a line that's very telling as well. Like they're celebrating a fake Christmas in which Tallahassee is pretending to be Santa and distributing gifts and all of these wonderful things. They're living in the White House at this moment in time, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, And long story short, um, it looks like that one's going to focus on the younger actress that you mentioned and like kind of her story arc and how she wants to like leave the nest so and so on and so forth. But we come back to Columbus for just a moment as he's like kind of reliving this fake Christmas day that they have at the White House, the four of them living together. And he does say the same thing um, at the beginning of that film. This is probably the best time of my life to include pre-Z, which he's saying. So even before like a zombie apocalypse takes place, he's never had a better moment in life than living with these four and well, living with these three other individuals in the White mm-hmm. House recreating humanity right like so i think that's actually quite telling yeah and in that film he ends up proposing to wichita and she accepts is like one of the plot points there so it takes a whole other film for their relationship i guess to go to the next level but it doesn't really matter for zombie land he still gets the girl in the end right which is the main like plot device so bishop's argument you know i mean he applies northrop fry's framework to this zombie comedy to prove that, you know, it's not just about grotesque violence. It's not just about the laughs. This isn't just a subgenre of the zombie genre, which already doesn't get, you know, serious inquiry from critics or the Academy, that the zombie comedy genre is an important, you know, fixture of drama and can be applied to all of these serious literary theories and frameworks and archetypes. And there's something much deeper than, you know, just the the double tap and the, you know, cardio and all of the funny things that are in Zombieland that made it, you know, popular among the general public. It's actually an incredible work of drama on its own, right? Because there's much deeper subtext really throughout the film. It's not just about zombies and shooting them and killing them and, you know, exploding their heads, that it's really about human beings And Columbus does go through this, you know, transformation throughout the film. He follows the hero's journey, this arc, where he's a different person at the end than he is at the beginning. He really fills that lack, right? The lack of a girlfriend, lack of a family, lack of belonging. He goes through, you know, the entire plot. And in the end, he gets the girl, he has a family, and he belongs, right? And so that we should take this seriously, this zombie comedy uh, genre. Anything else to add? No, 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 no. I think it actually, like I said, I, I, I think kind of in, in conclusion, I think not just among audiences, but among critics, and I think that's one of the points that he wrote the article is that this is an obviously oft overlooked for the overly simplistic nature, um, especially in like critical responses of this trope. 
And I think there's mm-hmm. actually a lot there that we could probably add in a later episode discussing not just, of course, zom- zombie comedies, but like the zombie trope in general about in terms mm-hmm. of like quality storytelling and quality narratives. In this case, us, the consumers might know a little bit more about the, and he does, he critiques like the academic or the film experts or those in this case as to what makes for a good film or a compelling story or um, a social critique, even those types of things. I think we over we overthink it. Like it needs to be deeper mm-hmm. than it is, but there's something that's clearly drawing people back to this. This, this zombie trope, whether that zombie trope is the more serious kind, that catharsis kind, or if it's this comedy kind, I think it's overlooked. And I think we're going to explore this a little bit further in, in a couple of the future episodes as well. I think it's overlooked anyway. For sure. Hope you enjoyed that episode. If you really like what we do, please, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who keep us motivated to creating content. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.